so um thank you everybody who's logged in for tonight's um webinar um just a few housekeeping things before i introduce you to our speaker um we'll be monitoring um the chat and the q a so please put any of your questions for, for rachel in the q a which we can share with her at the end and then any comments or if you've got any technical issues please just put them in the comment box um we'll, we will be recording this session or it's already started recording so that we can share that um with people who can't make it at this time or in different time zones um so um tonight we have the great pleasure between wild welfare and global animal welfare to welcome rachel ever see who's the director and co-founder of Wild Futures. So this is a UK based primate welfare and conservation charity that runs the Monkey Sanctuary in Cornwall. And um, if you haven't been to visit, then I highly recommend a visit. So a major focus for Wild Futures is the exotic pet trade and in particular the campaign to end the primate pet trade. So the charity works with several of the major animal welfare organizations on this and is a regular advisor to DEFRA, the UK government agency responsible for animal welfare. Um, Wild Futures has a focus on education at every level, working with schools, colleges and universities. Um, the Monkey Sanctuary is accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, GFAS, and is home to primates rescued from the UK um, primate pet trade. Rachel's been working with primates for close to four decades has got amazing experience um, and I'm sure she's going to share much of that with you. She's spoken in the UK and European Parliament on the subject of primate welfare as well as presenting and guest speaking for the Primate Society of Great Britain um, and various colleges and universities including the University of Cambridge and Oxford Brookes. Um, she's also worked with various NGOs and government agencies in the UK and abroad. Um, Wild Futures is also a founder member of EARS, the European Alliance for Rescue Centres and Sanctuaries. Rachel's currently work, working as a partner representative on the board of EARS and a member of the Captive Care Working Group for the SGB. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm not going to take up the time, I'm going to hand over to Rachel um, and so we can hear um, from her. So thank you Rachel for joining us. Okay, um, thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Um, I will put my get the slides back up on screen. There we go. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, as I said, thank you very much, Nick, for the introduction um, and and for everybody for attending today. Um, these things are always a little bit strange because I, I can't see the audience, um, but you can see me. But hopefully you'll uh, get to ask any questions at the end and give me some feedback as to what you think. So I'll start with um, just a little bit of an introduction, um, perhaps, uh, expanding a bit on what Nick was saying about Wild Futures, um, just who we are and why we were needed. Um, I'm sure a lot of people attending tonight will know that uh, the planet is undergoing a, a biodiversity crisis and primates are very much a, a part of that. And of course, by primates, I mean non-human primates. Um, Many of the species, a uh, majority of the species even, uh, are threatened with extinction and a uh, vast majority uh, have declining populations due to human actions. The threats that they face are those that are faced by many species across the planet. Um, habitat loss, um, trade, as in bushmeat trade and uh, the pet trade, and of course, the big subject of the moment and of the future, which is climate change as well. So wild futures is needed because primates are under serious threat on so many levels. And as a UK based uh, charity focusing on primate welfare and conservation, um, we 
focus in particular on the UK primate pet trade um, and the abuse of primates in captivity. Um, as Nick said, we have a, a sanctuary uh, for primates in need um, in, in near Lou in, in Cornwall. But underpinning our ethos and our philosophy is very much a desire to have a holistic approach. Um, so all the work that we do with primates is looking at the, the bigger picture, um, looking at primates in the perspective of their natural ecology and in and the, the, uh, with the perspective also of, of human behavior. Um, and the wider picture also involves our understanding um, of the needs and the way that we live um, on this world together with natural habitats, uh, whether they be the non-human primates or others. Um, so we also, as a charity, um, seek to uh, live by example and our flagship, the Monkey Sanctuary, um, also um, is, is that the land and the grounds are managed for UK habitats. Um, and much of our education work tries to bring the links of welfare and conservation together so people can see that one cannot be addressed without, without the other. And at the scope of our work um, is not just focusing at the sanctuary itself, but we, we seek also um, to share our experience, um, our skills, um, and where we can, we will support other projects with funding. Um, and we're very keen that where possible also, um, people working with the charity get the opportunity to collaborate and, and work on other projects um, to, to share experience and, and capacity. And how, how do we do it and uh, where have we come from? Well, World Futures uh, very much stands on the shoulders of the teams that have come before us. Um, we were founded in 1964, um, originally as the, the Woolly Monkey Sanctuary. So we have over 57 years experience caring for, for primates in captivity. In fact, we're probably, the sanctuary was probably the first of its type in the world. Um, so in 1964, the whole concept, the, uh, the idea of a sanctuary was very novel. Um, and today, many of the ideas and the principles are, on which our work is based are very much accepted and are used around the world. But at the time that we started, it really was um, seen as, as new um, and perhaps even a little bit eccentric. We started just with woolly monkeys. Um, and they were all rescue animals, but they were encouraged to, to breed at that time um, with the hope that that was the best way of giving them quality of life and perhaps that they would be able to eventually be returned to a, a natural habitat. And the way that, that was done and for us to become the first place that kept woolly monkeys alive in captivity long enough not just to breed one generation, but several generations, and therefore forming a, a semi-natural social group, um, was by using and developing innovative social management techniques um, and enclosure design, uh, which I can explain a, a little later. But over the years, we did realize um, that the future for the woolly monkeys in our care was not going to be in natural habitat, um, and that was for genetic reasons and also for a greater understanding of disease transfer between, uh, or potential disease transfer between captive populations and, and wild populations. And so we instigated a non-breeding policy in, in 2000. And it was at that point also that we were starting to get and see a big rise in the primate pet trade in the UK once more, having the, the pet trade having um, declined somewhat um, since the early 60s um, with the implementation of various international treaties. Um, but as breeders and dealers saw ways of getting around that and focusing on captive bred um, species, we started to get phone calls asking for help. And so as we stopped breeding, we were, start, we were able to then um, turn to other species and, and offer help. And as Nick has said, um, as an organization, um, 
we very much believe in collaborating and sharing our skills and experience. And, and part of that is our work with as, as founder members of the European Alliance of Rescue Centres and Sanctuaries. Um, and uh, I'm presently serving on the board of EARS. Um, and it's always, um, well, it's part of the fundamental ethos of, of our charity that we can share in this way and help raise capacity um, in sanctuaries around the world. Um, and our uh, welfare standards, um, our educational work, um, our philosophy, I think, has been recognised by the fact that um, the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries has um, awarded us an accreditation status, um, and we are the only accredited sanctuary in, in Europe. So, as I said, um, our holistic approach is uh, underpins everything that we do. We have a biodiversity crisis. We spend much of our time in our educational work uh, reminding people that um, although when they come to see the monkeys, for instance, um, um, conservation is not just about the exotic, it's about the, our own environment and where we live. Um, and managing our grounds um, and um, land for native wildlife and using it as an example um, and showing people methods of ways that they can look after and care for the land in a sustainable way. Um, hopefully shows people that it's something that everybody can aspire to and, and that it's also extremely necessary. Um, we look to um, not just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. So um, our um, sustainability ethos um, encompasses um, everything that we do, um, whether it's um, how we buy things, where we buy things from, making sure that human rights as well as animal rights are, 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 are looked to. Um, we compost all our food and the monkey waste. Um, we use solar panels. We encourage and educate people about plant-based diets, um, looking at the both conservation and welfare issues in everything that we do, and hopefully showing people, as I've said, that these are issues that um, have to work in tandem um, to be really effective. And where we can, we like we look outwards and sharing our skills um, and, and knowledge. Um, in the last couple of years, this has been very tricky for economic and for um, COVID reasons. Um, but we like to provide, for instance, seed funding to, to projects um, in um, primate habitat, um, working with NGOs and to, to promote their work, um, particularly in education and community projects. Um, and a very effective way of doing that um, for an organization that doesn't have lots of spare cash is um, offering um, skill secondment and skills sharing where perhaps we can visit projects or um, uh, members of other organizations can come stay with us. Uh, um, and hopefully we, we learn from each other and benefit um, primates and habitats in that way. Our educational work, as Nick said, extends through to schools and, and colleges. Um, we receive um, tens of thousands of visitors on site every year. Um, that is in, in normal years. Um, things have been a little tricky under COVID um, as we've had to take some really strict measures to protect the, the monkeys in our care. Um, but we also um, run various uh, volunteer training programs or internships. And these we're really proud of um, because we are training the next generation of uh, conservationists and, and people working in animal welfare and, and other fields. Um, and one very effective programme that we've been running for the last few years um, has been with the European Solidarity Corps under Erasmus Plus. And we'll take um, up to five um, young people for 12 months and they will train with us and it can be as caregivers or on education or they may focus on the site and sustainability work. And these are five of our, our last cohort. We have a, a wonderful new group um, with us right now. Um, but just as an example of how it works um, and how proud we are of this, 
Um, these five young women um, have all um, graduated successfully from us. Um, three of them are now working in conservation and animal welfare. Um, one of them is um, now gone on to do a PhD um, and uh, the, the fifth has actually uh, joined our team on a permanent contract. But the primate pet trade and why it is a major focus for, for wild futures. Uh, we wish it wasn't, and we, we, we would love to be in a position where as a charity, we were working much more on a, a theoretical level or a practical level uh, fundraising for projects uh, around the world. Um, but as long as there is a UK pet trade and a sanctuary uh, is required in the UK, then we will be around to do our best um, to raise the, the issues involved and protect primates um, from this really sad uh, life. Um, the pictures that you see on the screen here are all of um, situations, um, cages and uh, monkeys who have been uh, rescued by wild futures uh, from the UK trade. And you can see we're passionate about this. Um, we've been campaigning or really hard for nearly 20 years. And we're closer now to achieving, seeing an end to the trade um, in the UK than we've ever been before. Um, there is a, a bill going through Parliament at present, which is the Animal Welfare Kept Animals Bill, um, which promises great things. We're, never, we're not quite sure whether we should be cheering or jeering, crying or, 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 or cheering. Um, this is really, uh, we're in a really tricky place um, and a critical place with this right now. Um, how we've got here, um, it's been hard work, but it's not been us on our own and it's certainly not been me on my own. Um, this has been about having a fantastic team at Wild Futures and about us collaborating um, and building relationships with lots of other organisations um, in the UK. Um, in particular with the RSPCA, um, we've written reports um, with, with the RSPCA, with I4, um, on our own behalf, um, um, with Animal Defenders International, um, we have collaborated on petitions and presented tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of signatures um, to number 10, um, all supporting the principle that the primate pet trade in the UK must be ended. Um, we have um, produced Maury polls, uh, which shows that the general public really support this issue. And of course, we've put time into research to prove why this trade has got to end, what the suffering is involved. And in all of this takes time. Um, it takes a lot of dedicated people. Um, we have to um, find new ways all of the time of catching the media's attention um, and getting, um, getting articles printed in, in paper newspapers, online, through social media, um, and only by working together um, as, as, a, as a collaborative movement, really, I think, is, um, is this possible. And it's not just a group of people focused on, perhaps the, the NGOs focused on animal welfare, um, we also work with the, the stakeholders and professionals who also have that face-to-face -face experience um, with, with primates in the pet trade. And that includes the British Veterinary Association. And it took a number of years, but we are really pleased to see they're very much on board um, and campaigning with us to see an end to this trade. And to get there, as I've said, um, we've worked hard to get media attention um, and to also within our research um, to garner the support and the information and the understanding of all the people that need to, to, to know about this. Um, we've been to Parliament several times, um, we've held receptions, we've attended um, APGOR meetings, which is the All Party Group for Animal Welfare. 
um, we've presented um, to small groups of MPs, we've presented to hundreds of MPs, um, we've given official evidence for EFRA committees, um, we've presented on, on paper as well as through PowerPoint, um, we've answered government's call for, for evidence um, and we've attended many a, a DEFRA meeting um, producing evidence for why primates should not be kept as pets. Um, and keeping a high profile for this has been really important. When this campaign started um, in the early 2000s, we were simply told that it wasn't an issue, that there were no pet primates out there, and if there were, it was just a handful. Um, and one of the fundamental principles, of course, um, that we had to fight for was that numbers actually don't matter. If one animal suffers, then things have got to be changed. They need protecting. And in, fact, in working with DEFRA on the animal welfare um, bill, what became the Animal Welfare Act, um, in the early 2000s, um, that was actually very much a, a principle of the act. Numbers don't matter. It's the individual animal suffering that matters. Um, however, sadly, um, we have been able to show that the primate pet trade does include um, thousands of individual animal suffering. It's not just a, a small handful. And so we've presented um, at primate society meetings at universities, as I said, in parliament. And I, you can imagine there are many receptions in parliament with many lobbying groups or campaign groups vying to get people's attention. Um, and so we had to really come up with imaginative ways of, of getting that attention. Um, we were able to get Jane Goodall on screen. We were able to uh, get celebrities, if you like, like um, Joanna Lumley to support our campaign and to get Bill Oddie to, um, in his own unique way, face to face, talk to MPs about animal suffering and why it has to end. Um, but really, one of the, the great things that we did was to have a, a wonderful sculptor called Rudy Weller, who was given permission to place his more than life size sculptures in Westminster Hall outside of the reception room. Um, and as the hundreds of MPs went about, about their business that day, they all saw those sculptures and they couldn't resist coming up to have a look. And therefore, our reception became one of the best attended of, of all time. And what did we have to explain? We had to explain to these MPs that um, this suffering and this story goes back a long time. Um, primates, non-human primates that is, first arrived in Britain and started being kept as pets um, in the early 1500s um, at a time when um, the English in particular were, were going out and exploring the world and bringing back all kinds of new plants and, and animals. Um, Catherine of Aragon reputedly had uh, about 14 pet monkeys and it became very fashionable for royalty and the nobility um, to, to keep primates as pets. And from there, there's been a continuous story. Um, they were kept as mascots on ships. There's a very unfortunate story of, um, of a monkey being washed up during the Nap Napoleonic Wars when one of Napoleon's ships were sunk and uh, a monkey, I don't know what species, but dressed in French uniform was, um, was put on trial and hanged on the beach in Hartlepool as seen as a, as a French traitor. And the story goes on, um, the picture that you see there in 1972, um, was perhaps at the height of, um, of time when primates were being brought in um, from abroad on a regular basis um, in their thousands to be kept for both the zoo trade and the, the pet trade. Um, and that little girl in the middle there is me on holiday in Cornwall, um, spotted by a photographer and my mum being talked into us having our picture taken. When I look at that picture now, I see with horror that those monkey's teeth have been pulled. Um, never mind the fact they've got their that they're, they're, they're in clothes, um, they've had their faces shaved, it, just a horror story. And I and my family were part of that. Um, little did I know that when I grew up, I'd be spending 
my my time and my passion trying to bring it to an end. But uh, the trade continues. Um, in 2010, um, as we were rescuing more and more monkeys, it was a common sight to see capuchins kept in people's gardens and in and, uh, garden sheds. Primates continue to be um, bought and sold um, through the internet, um, through the media, um, small amounts through breeders and dealers, but increasingly um, just from families who can see that they can make easy money, particularly with the smaller species. Marmosets breed, um, they have twins, they can breed up to twice a year. Those individuals can be sold um, for £1,500, sometimes for £2,000 each. That's quite good money as a, as a hobby. And so the, the trade continues. And in 2021, this is a common sight. Um, if you go on to um, specialist forums and you go onto the internet, these are the kind of cages that um, monkeys are still being kept in. Um, here you've got what are called parrot cages. Um, the cages on the, the right there, the double set of cages, those are actually in a downstairs toilet. Um, the owner who had these was a young man who's actually a student. He bought two monkeys. Before he knew it, they had babies. He moved them out of the hamster size cage into what he described to me when I asked him about their conditions. He just said, well, they're in very big cages, so they're, they're okay, but I don't understand why they're fighting. Um, and of course, they'd gone on to have several babies and the more monkeys there were, the more the, the higher the aggression. And the, the, the male of the group, the father started attacking his female partner and the babies um, and causing some quite serious harm, at which point they were separated into two so-called big cages. Um, but that's when we got the phone call asking for help. And of course, that the suffering that is created by this is because primates are just not suitable for keeping in a domestic setting. They have their own unique socially complex um, needs. They are wild animals, they're not domesticated. And this is something which is really not understood by the majority of, of owners. And we've never met an owner who has deliberately harmed their, their pet. The big problem is a, a lack of understanding. And the most fundamental thing is that because an animal is born in captivity, it doesn't make it domesticated. Um, and if you have time to take a look, there's an interesting study by Driscoll et al, um, it published in 2009, looking at pre-adaptations to domestication. And he bases this on various, um, uh, various uh, areas of um, ecology and, and behavior, um, social structure, food preferences, captive breeding, um, aggressiveness, um, a captive temperament and commensal initiative. And the more you go through the sub um, um, clauses of, of, of these areas, the more you're able to understand why primates um, are not suited to, to, um, to life as a pet because they are not domesticated and they're not predisposed to any type of domestication. And so really, we can only describe what happens to primates when they're kept as pets as abuse. As I said, this is not something which is usually deliberate. Um, animals are treated um, with cruelty, rarely with violence, but it's definitely regular. And the environment, the conditions in which the monkeys are kept are constant. Because you know, you, the, the way that most primates are raised for the pet trade and in the, UK, in the UK is that they are bred in the UK, they are removed from their families um, and from um, their, usually from the, the mothers, um, in the case of calatrichids from the family group as well. Um, so the maternal deprivation, social deprivation of conspecifics, they're fed an inappropriate diet, um, they 
I certainly suffer from a lack of adequate space. You can see the size cages that I've already shown you. And in that sort of environment, um, for a highly intelligent species, um, hardwired for complex social life and a complex environment, the lack of mental stimulation um, certainly creates huge problems. As I said, it's the lack of education and understanding by people and by owners um, that causes the problems. Um, I've explained about the, the marmosets and such a common story, people buying one, two marmosets, not understanding where that's going to take them. And before they know it, things are out of hand. Monkeys are attacking each other and attacking owners. And of course, the cute pet that um, is needy, is emotionally looking for support and a relationship because they've been removed um, from their, um, their own, from, from their mothers and from their family groups, they'll be very responsive um, to the new owner when they're, when they're very young. But as wild animals, they grow, their instincts kick in, they try to find a place in the social hierarchy and the trouble begins. The owners become, get bitten, there's a lot of aggression towards other family members. And it all comes, as I keep saying, down to the fact that as a society, we understand on the whole, the needs of domestic animals. Um, there's a lot of interesting work done by um, Sarah Hansen and Brooke Aldrich, um, both um, present and, and past Wild Futures team members, um, looking at, and what they did was to, to look at um, people's understanding of primate behavior and, and compared it to that of, of the animals that we're more familiar with and domesticated animals. Um, and what was, what definitely came out of their, their research is that there is a big gap in that understanding. So on the whole, people understand what a cat or a dog is trying to tell them. They know how to respond to it. Well, they absolutely do not do that with primates. They misunderstand um, both um, facial, facial um, gestures, um, and body, body language um, and, and sound. And this is how the monkeys end up um, in this sort of sad situation. Big, um, the, some of the pictures here you can see just that's why animals end up in, in cages which are, to the expert eye, obviously inadequate, as in the, the concrete aviary on the, on the top picture. Um, and where owners think, well, yes, perhaps my monkey might be lonely when I'm out at work all day. So what I'll do is I'll leave the pet dog in the garden so that they can keep each other company. And what they don't realize that the, the dog gets frustrated um, and will spend the day circling the monkey. The monkey has nowhere to escape and becomes more and more neurotic and aggressive. And we have several monkeys at our sanctuary um, who have been traumatized through years of, of, of being trapped with a, an animal in, in this way. And then the central picture, again, showing lack of understanding of what is appropriate um, and lack of knowledge of the potential danger of zoonosis. Um, COVID, of course, has thrown up um, this issue big time in the last couple of years. Um, and this is the, the picture in the middle there is of, of Mr. Monkey, one of the um, characters that we care for, a capuchin monkey that we care for at our sanctuary now. Um, as a youngster, he not only lived in the house with his owners um, and shared food with them and sat on the table with them, but he even shared the family jacuzzi. Um, and when you look at the potential for disease sharing either direction, this is really quite terrifying. But it's not just about poor understanding from the general public and from, from owners. This is also a, a big problem um, in the veterinary world. Vets do not get the time or the training um, to specialize in primates. Um, very few have got the background necessary to recognize and understand and therefore to, um, to know how to, to deal with primates and the problems that are presented to them 
um, if and when they ever are, are brought in. And I should say that it's, it can be quite rare. Um, most of the uh, primates that we have rescued have never visited a vet or been seen by a vet. Common mistake, for instance, um, made is, is an owner will bring in their primate or report to the, the vet that their, their primate, their pet has now has become aggressive and that they can't cope, that he's biting, um, what can be done? And the vet will recommend that they, they're castrated. It's a behavioral management tool and it doesn't work. Um, there's an interesting hormonal pathway in, in humans and in, in primates, which means that castration doesn't have the same effect that it does in, in cats or dogs. In our experience, uh, we have definitely seen a correlation between the, those males that have been castrated and particular physical and psychological um, issues and, and lack of development, which has meant that as well as the other problems that they bring with them, um, when they come to the sanctuary and as they try to learn how to live back in social groups, they have an extra hurdle to overcome um, because of the apparent um, physiological changes um, and hormonal changes caused by, by castration. Um, the other areas sometimes is vets can just simply be scared of taking action because they're not sure what they should do. Um, the picture there uh, on the bottom uh, right corner is of a capuchin called Missy. She was about 38 years old when she was brought to us. She had been in various so-called licensed sanctuaries, um, kept um, in um, with numerous owners. She had massive problems with metabolic bone disease. Now that should have been pretty obvious. Um, she had lost toes. She had lost half her tail. Um, one of the sanctuary owners had actually witnessed the tail um, actually dropping off in front of him. Um, she had a huge dental issues and she had a massive parasitic load. She was definitely seen by the vet. The vet didn't know what to do about it. She was never properly diagnosed and therefore not treated. Um, we were simply only able to help make her comfortable in her last few weeks of life. And obviously um, cases like, like Missy are extreme, but the suffering that we see amongst pet primates is universal. There isn't a single individual animal that has come in that hasn't had some sort of behavioral and or um, physical problem. Um, this is just one snapshot example and doesn't actually include the marmosets in our care now. Um, and, and so they, now are, are, are um, displaying more issues, more problems, particularly uh, metabolic bone disease. But you can see that there's a whole range of behavioral issues that are common to um, pet primates. Um, and this isn't just true at our sanctuary. We haven't got a, a small group that uh, are showing extraordinary behavior. This is common to many places and sanctuaries around the world who will, um, who are, who are finding just the same kind of things. So stereotypic behavior, repetitive behavior, pathological behavior, that can be attributed um, to the problems solved in, um, um, in, to, in uh, primates when they're kept as pets. Um, most primates don't just show one kind of behavior, they often have a whole range of these behaviors. And they're very much they, they run very deep, they're really deeply ingrained. So by the time the uh, primates arrive at our sanctuary, they have often um, do, been displaying or using these uh, behaviors to help them cope with their situation. Um, and they've been doing this for many years. And we always see some improvement. And for that, hopefully, I think we can be proud of the team that work with, these mon with the monkeys and helping them recover. Um, but some never recover fully, and there's always some issue that is left behind. Um, it can be quite extreme. So we had one wonderful character called Josh, um, male capuchin, um, who when he was brought to us by the police, we were told he was super aggressive. And one 
way that he showed this aggressive this aggression was actually he turned it on himself and when he couldn't lash out he would bite his own tail um, and he had bitten off the end of the tail it was it, he had it, it, was, it was red and it was sore there was an open wound there the moment we started introducing him to other monkeys he miraculously just stopped he stopped self-harming and he focused on his new friends and he his recovery was extraordinary and it was really fast. He um, became the leader of, uh, of his small family group. Um, a, 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 a success story that we, we didn't expect. On the other hand, Chanel, who you see pictured here, um, when she arrived with us, she had arrived actually with a companion. She had lived with another monkey, um, but her behaviors um, were, ran much deeper, if you like they were more introverted. Um, so she was turning much more on herself, her anger was turning on herself. She did seek and, and continues to seek a lot of human uh, attention. Um, she a lot of repetitive behavior, jumping up and down, clapping, grinding her teeth. Um, and then when she'd really worked herself up into a frenzy, when she couldn't cope, she would then adopt what we call these sort of yoga positions. So awkward um, postures or movements that would require um, a lot of concentration. Um, something that we do voluntarily, um, perhaps when we do yoga, and what they do is that they help produce endorphins that help relax us and make us feel better. And that's probably what Chanel is trying to do. Her recovery has been much slower. Um, all the monkeys at our sanctuary um, although we are open to the public for some months of the year, all the monkeys have the choice um, to, to spend their time out of sight of the public, to choose to move away so that they don't have to be seen if they don't want to. For many years, um, we were not even able to give Chanel that choice because if she was in front of the public, she couldn't draw herself away. Um, and so we had to make sure that she, she wasn't there in order to, for her to be able to focus on, on her recovery and her relationship with the other monkeys. And it's taken nine years before she was able to uh, relax sufficiently that she could behave much more normally around people. So recovery and rehabilitation is absolutely dependent on the individual's character and their previous experience. And of course they come with many, many physical disorders as well. Um, living in a, a small cage with an inappropriate diet, lack of sunlight um, inevitably leads to huge problems. And of course, the psychological issues, raised stress levels, all of this feeds in and um, eventually can be um, displayed as a, a pathological physical illness. Uh, metabolic bone disease, of course, um, through lack of sunlight and inability to make vitamin D3. Almost every uh, monkey that's arrived at our sanctuary has had dental and um, dental disease issues. Uh, uh, high blood sugars, um, particularly um, problematic um, through poor diet and, and lack of exercise. And how do we deal with this. I mean, behavioral issues, as I said, can run deep and can be really problematic. Um, Morella here has two ways of, of dealing with her stresses. One is that she will become, she will play with a, a particular object, but she can become obsessive and it stops her from relating to the, the to, to her friends and, and, and her new family. So sometimes removing an object um, is sufficient. Um, but always you have to make sure that you're not then causing greater distress because they have nothing to focus on. So providing interesting distraction, um, enrichment, whether that's social or, or, or practical, physical, um, moving groups around um, our territory. Um, I'll be able to show you some pictures um, later, but the territory at the sanctuary is designed so that all the enclosures that are linked uh, by runways um, and, and tunnels so that the monkeys are able to move from one area to another. And each group is regularly moved around the entire sanctuary so that the monkeys get a new environment, new neighbors, 
um, and all of that brings the kind of mental and social stimulation that is essential for them. Um, where necessary, we also use medication um, to help calm and relax um, the in individuals, depending on, on their particular needs. Um, Morella, for instance, here you can see, um, if she's denied the ability to have a, a physical distraction, she can turn on herself. You can see an ulcerated tail there where she has self-harmed. Um, I mentioned uh, diabetes, um, and this is an ongoing issue and a big issue for so many primates. And you would think that it would be diagnosed while um, these animals were pets, but a monkey like grips um, on the top picture there, um, when he arrived with us, his coat was soaking wet and it was sticky. And the reason it was wet is because he was excreting sugar through his skin and into his fur um, on such a scale that, and, and this, this was just, this is survival mode. This is one way of the body trying to get rid of uh, high blood sugar, which is, which is really toxic. Um, when the owner had actually shown the grips to the vet, the vet suggested that he just needed to be bathed more often, completely missing the um, origin of the, of the problem. Um, grips eventually required insulin treatment, um, and he didn't reach his full 35 years that a capuchin should, should reach. Um, he did die young as a, because of the organ um, damage done by many years of living with, with diabetes. The monkeys also live, um, they, they lose toes, loss of extremities, they suffer sores and abscesses, they have respiratory issues. Um, this is not a minor condition um, or lesser suffering. This is a really, um, is, is cruelty. And metabolic bone disease. This is something that we see more and more particularly um, common amongst uh, marmosets. Um, picture here you can see of the um, of a capuchin. Um, there's a monkey, Joey, who was kept in a wardrobe-sized cage for nine years with no access to, um, to direct sunlight, unable to make vitamin D3 on a poor diet. He ended up with, as you can see, a concave rib cage, um, scoliosis, so a curved spine, a fused spine. His long bones were all curved. His bone density was poor. But his bone density was so poor in his face that as he grew, his body was unable to make bone and so compensated by making cartilage. So his, his facial features were also very distorted. And you can see that somewhat also in the other two characters here, the photos you've got. Um, a um, Indy, the Marmoset, and Gucci, Capuchin. And they've also got issues with metabolic bone disease. And Gucci in particular there um, um, with um, a, a cleft palate, um, which might be a um, congenital issue, um, perhaps caused by um, vitamin deficiency um, um, in her mother as a monkey who was used um, for frequent breeding. Um, and again, these both monkeys were seen as vets at some point in their lives, and both vets misdiagnosed the, the cause and the origins of the problems for this. So rehabilitation. Well, the obvious thing, what do the monkeys need? They need space. So a picture here of our sanctuary. Um, we, we haven't got a huge site, but we try to make the very most of what we do have. Most important of all, um, monkeys need each other. They, they're conspecifics. They, so to relearn how to be monkeys, um, to relearn their language, their behavior, and just enjoy each other's company. And of course, they need a good diet um, so that physically they are healthy and that then supports the rest of their recovery. And this is what I'm talking about um, in looking at their monkey's territory and what's essential for them. So again, whenever we look at our enclosures and when you're living with the monkeys from day to day, we're always aware of just how small it is. For species that are designed to live and to, in, in a forest um, to travel several kilometers a day, um, we can never com compensate for that completely, but we try to make the enclosures interesting. We try to move them around. You can see uh, one of the barbering macaques there moving from one area to another. Um, 
on the indoor, you can see some of the, the runways that um, enable us to move the monkeys as in, in their groups from one section of the sanctuary to another, creating stimulation. And as I said, new neighbors, and new environments. And of course our climate provides all kinds of enrichment. It's not always so positive. Um, occasionally we get snow and it's a reminder as to why these tropical animals really shouldn't be in our temperate climate. And what legislation is there that protects these primates? And what is it that we've been fighting over these years? Well, at present, there's the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, very much designed uh, for human safety. Um, very little in there about um, animal welfare um, with very little information as to how a local authority should judge an animal's condition. More recently, um, the Animal Welfare Act came into to play in 2006, which contains at least a duty of care for the first time. Um, we fought our way through this Animal Welfare Act, trying to highlight the fact that it wouldn't be sufficient on its own to protect primates. Um, eventually, uh, government conceded with a code of practice. Um, we certainly contributed this, we helped to write it, but it's very much a code for experts and not for a local authority for owner. And it, it depends on skilled ability to interpret. And it also doesn't have the full teeth of, of a law. It simply provides guidelines. Um, and that's why we've had to continue to fight for uh, legislative change. There are also some international, there's some international protection which has certainly reduced the pet trade coming into this country, um, but not altogether. All and then of course there's the uh, Pet Animals Act, which regulates breeding and selling of animals. Um, again, the enforcement um, and understanding behind this is simply not being sufficient. Um, we have, as an organization, as a charity focused on the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, um, we survey our local, the local authorities in the UK every year, um, trying to keep track of who is where, what conditions they're kept in. Um, it's, what it shows is the, the inadequacy of the law. Um, only those species um, under the DWA schedule um, need a license and government itself has admitted that there is an 80 to 90% non-compliance rate. So the vast majority of primate species that are kept as, as pets, and certainly the vast majority in number, terms of numbers, um, don't need a license. And therefore, finding out where those monkeys are, monitoring their welfare, is next to impossible. And this is certainly true of, of marmosets. Um, we can only um, monitor the trade by working with organizations like the RSPCA, relying on people reporting to us and monitoring um, social media sites. So this inadequate legislation certainly leads to suffering um, and eventually the government and in fact all political parties um, have recognized this and in the last, um, in the lead up to the last general election, um, all the major parties uh, promised to ban the trade and keeping of primates as pets in the UK. How they're going to do it um, and how far they're really going to go with it is a whole nother question. Um, for, us, the, for us, the most important thing is that the government has to set the moral compass on this. Up until now, they have frequently told us that it's up to us to educate for people to receive that education and therefore rely on the market forces of supply and demand and hope that the demand goes down and therefore the suffering will go down. Uh, I think we've finally convinced them that this is not sufficient. And that's where we end with our kind of cause for hope by working together, by working our way over the years through the various um, legislative um, avenues that have been available to us, uh, both in this country and abroad, we have seen change and we are seeing change. The present Animal Welfare Kept Animals Bill does offer some hope, 
our great fear with it is that it's going to um, simply allow a licensing of the trade rather than the ending of the trade. Because fundamental to all of this, from what we've got to recognise and the governments have got to recognise and as a society is that in Wild Futures view is a move from seeing properties, from seeing our fellow species, see seeing them as property and recognise them as individuals and having rights um, of their own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that was very insightful. We do have time for um, a few questions. Um, hopefully you have time as well. Um, yes. So the first of the questions, um, it says, um, in your opinion, what is the best approach for a zoo educator to react to a child expressing a wish to have a pet primate when seeing a cute animal at the zoo? Oh, I think it's a pit when it's a child. Um, start, it is starting with the fact that getting the child to identify with that primate, the primate needs family and friends, just like they need their family and their friends. And they need to be family and friends of their own kind who speak the same language, who understand each other. Um, just giving examples of, um, of for that child, you know, can you imagine finding yourself in a new country, at a new school, where nobody speaks your language, where nobody understands who you are and what you need? Um, so yes, get, get the child to identify with the primate because children are very empathetic. They really get it once they see the suffering. Um, but if all they see is cute monkey in the cartoons that they've seen in, on film in the media, then that's, that distorts their image. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, oh, and remind them they will get bitten eventually too. <laughs> or at least remind the parents, that's the best way. Remind the parents that they will get bitten. Then they'll change their attitude. Yeah. Um, um, there, there's a the question just about the figure that I think you mentioned earlier. So is the 5,000 mm. primates um, in private ownership just the UK? Yes, it is. Yes, and the way that we've had to work this out is by looking at the number of licenses issued, looking at the number of reports to NGOs and to sanctuaries, um, and looking on social media to see the rate of, of sales, etc. So it, it's tricky, um, but I would say between four and 5,000 primates in the trade at any, any one time, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um I think we're still doing okay for time. I'm trying to get through these. Um, with the new proposed law to ban primate pets, are there plans to work with licensed rehab centres or open additional centres like Wild Futures and the Monkey Sanctuary to ensure the welfare of confiscated primates? Good question. Um, we would love to do this, yes. And the need is certainly there. If this law, is successful, if it has the teeth that it needs, there is going to be a big capacity problem. Um, I have been speaking with DEFRA about this. They are after information about capacity um, and the story that we're all telling them is that it's insufficient. Yep, so we certainly, we are very happy to reach out, advise, help, because that capacity is, is needed. Fabulous. Um, Plugging through, I think we've got a couple more minutes. Um, do you have any advice on introducing primates? So that's a big one. Um, that you might need a whole other session for this. You saw um, an almost yeah. immediate improvement in behaviour, like tail biting. Did you do anything out of the normal to um, help make the introduction the least stressful it could be? Every introduction is unique. Um, we, when a monkey arrives at our sanctuary, um, they spend the first 30 days um, in, their, um, in isolation and that it just for, to make sure that we can do all the medical testing, make sure that they, we can treat them as is needed, make sure they're not um, going to give monkeys that they meet anything that they shouldn't. 
but it's also time for us to watch their behavior, both for themselves, but also how they respond to other monkeys. And then the skill is matching them up to the right characters. And then it's a very gradual thing where we, they're brought close together, uh, but not within touching range. Eventually through the mesh, we have a very highly specialized territory, which enables us with hatchways, with tunnels, for the monkeys to gain their confidence, for us to see how they respond. Um, and when they're introduced, they're introduced for very small periods of time so that they can learn as gradually and at the rate that they need to. And for some monkeys, it's a few weeks and it's never shorter than that. Um, and for some monkeys, it's several months um, and it can be even longer. But we're working on the principle that they're going to be with us for very many years. So there's no need to rush because every monkey needs their, their own time. It's very labor intensive, but it's always successful that way. Mm, fabulous. Monkey if anybody has specific questions for the situation they're in, then certainly do come back and ask. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and they can, they, they, we can help put people in touch with you if necessary. Um, yeah. Another question actually just about um, the monkeys themselves, what kind of social groups do you have? So are they all same sex or mixed? Um, all species in one group? Um, yeah. um, at the moment, they're um, only, um, they're, they're all the same species, each group. So we don't have any mixed species groups. Um, they, they are usually uh, mixed uh, as well. So males and females together. Um, and we also try to have an a age range. Uh, different age range that can we, that can vary. Um, we do sometimes find, for instance, that with uh, a group of very elderly individuals, um, they can no longer cope with the the enthusiasm and uh, energy of, of youngsters. And so, the, the the groupings can change over time as well. So it's huge variety. In other words. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, this is a really good question, given what you were just saying um, in terms about the veterinary profession, what could vets do to educate themselves more on primate health? Um, there are veterinary specialists, um, so do contact us about that and we can, we can help um, to put them in contact. Um, and I would say visiting sanctuaries like ourselves, and um, we have actually run open days and courses in the um, in the past pre-COVID days, um, inviting vets to, to come along and look at the issues and recognise behaviours. Um, so, yeah, contact um, us if you need help. <laughs> absolutely. One more question snuck in just then. Um, what are you doing to prevent breeding? Oh, good question. Yes, as a non-breeding. Um, we've used various ways of, of doing this. Um, with the woolly monkeys originally, um, we were using um, the pill um, and with mostly uh, and, and implants, um, but that was not 100% successful. Um, we needed to use the pill though because of the behavioral ecology of, of, of uh, woolly monkeys um, to reduce stress. Um, but on the whole, what we do is vasectomize the males um, so that they don't know anything's any different. Behavior can continue as normal, um, but we just can guarantee that there won't be any babies. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Um, conscious of the time and, um, and your evening as well. Um, so we're really grateful to you for sharing 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 this evening and all your information and knowledge and the whole journey which has been incredible and there's some amazing comments coming through of appreciation from from everybody who attended so um, and like i said at the beginning anyone who's not visited the, the monkey sanctuary i really recommend it um beautiful part of the country as well um an amazing work which you've had some insight to tonight from rachel herself um but thank you, thank you very much. No, you're very welcome. And as I said, if people have any further questions or want to know about a particular aspect in more detail, um, then do get in touch. Fabulous. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Take have care, everyone. Thanks for joining. See you, bye. Bye.